Okay, well, we're one past the hour, so we'll just go ahead and get started. I'd like to welcome everyone to our instructional webinar today called Model for Analysis, Sharing and Standardizing Food Electronic Environmental Data, or Mass Feed. Um, my name is Becky Labo, and I'm a Senior Evaluation Specialist for the National Environmental Health Association. So thank you for being with us today. Um, before we begin, we want to share that this webinar and the developed resources were made possible through funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The webinar contents do not necessarily represent the official views of the CDC. Um, here is a quick overview of today's agenda. Um, in just a moment, I will be introducing our speaker for today. And during our time together, we will explain what mass feed is who benefits from the model, and what the re recommended practices are. We will be providing two Q&A sessions today, so there will be plenty of time for questions. Um, during the webinar, we will respond to the questions that some of you submitted upon reviewing the mass feed document. And between the two Q&A sessions, our speaker will provide a more in-depth explanation of the model's core components. Before we begin, just wanna go over a few housekeeping items. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will eventually be uploaded to NEHA's informatics webpage. Please use the Q&A box to submit any questions throughout the webinar. And please complete the evaluation survey you will receive after the webinar. Um, we really do use your feedback and recommendations to help improve our webinars and trainings. And then for those of you who may not be familiar with NEHA, um, allow me to provide a brief overview of who we are. We support the environmental public health workforce. And as an association, everything we do is to build, sustain, and empower environmental public health professionals so that they are equipped and prepared to protect the health of communities across the country. We support environmental public health by continuously providing the most up-to-date training, tools, and resources to the workforce who specialize in so many of the different fields that encompass environmental public health. NEHA is focused on increasing knowledge and skills across all our fields to build upon our workforce capacity, efficiency, and effectiveness. We also offer credentials to certify the expertise of our workforce. And in addition to our large online library of trainings, seminars, and available tools and resources, we host an annual educational conference, which includes multiple sessions focused on areas like policy and regulation, um, extreme weather, uh, like we happen to be having right now in Colorado, uh, preparedness and response, food safety, private wells, water quality, climate change, wildfire response, and many more other areas. So no matter where you are in your educational journey or professional career, NEHA has something to offer you. So please check out our website to learn more about becoming a member if you aren't already one. Um, the website is www.neha.org backslash membership. And as I mentioned, each year NEHA hosts our annual educational conference. This year's conference will be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, July 15th through the 18th. And our registration is currently open and we highly encourage you to attend. So you can learn more and register at the conference website or scan the QR code here on the, sl on the slide. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to now turn it over to our speaker today, Tim Callahan. Sorry, folks, a little slow on the uptake here. I, I'll start with uh, saying thanks for
time to uh, view this with me and to uh, uh, your curiosity service inspections and permitting and the regulatory were uh, a bit over 30 years local county office here in georgia after, uh, for the last on uh, managing and maintaining a, a data system across the state around i i completed and got my mph from augusta shall i take over the slides chris uh yes tim um and We'll monitor, but I know there was a little bit of lag with your uh, audio. So we'll just continue to monitor. We'll let you share your screen, but we'll let you know if you may need to turn camera off and just present. Will do. I need, I'm having a little problem with uh, my wonderful slides getting out there where I want them. And then being able to share. Forgive me, folks, this is uh, not my norm. If needed, I can share the screen and you can. I've got a plan. Okay. Is that working for us? Yes. Okay. So, uh, as I said, I'm Tim Callahan. I work in environmental health in Georgia. Uh, I'll move on from there. What we're here to talk about is uh, the mass feed uh, standard that we've tried to put together. We, we pursued this because there's about 3,000 independent environmental health agencies, uh, with local being city and county and tribal as well as state. Uh, and federal agencies, each of them handling food service inspections and permitting and regulatory services in some way. Unfortunately, there's no set standard data structures in place that allows for ways to share things. Uh, in private industry, you might have some advanced business intelligence capacity for you know, that allows for in an enterprise system to analyze things. But with those industries, you you know you get the benefit of being able to see patterns and uh, be able to act on those. In public sector, it's not quite so much. On uh, where private industry has used these advanced intelligent tools to find opportunities and utilize resources when they're limited. On um, we're only just now entering the current century with our capacity here in environmental health across the U.S. Uh, with so many different operations with varying capacities of uh, data literacy, resources available as far as funding, as far as understanding of how to set up a data system, uh, it's really rather difficult to figure out what data to collect and whether or not you can share it. Very few organizations have uh, modern data systems. Uh, some causes for this gap are due to high system costs. Uh, as well as the other challenges with cross-jurisdictional cooperation. In addition to an inability to compare apples to apples uh, for best practices, we're missing out on opportunities like you know, faster illness investigations, uh, active communication to prevent violations, such as uh, what we're trying here in Georgia is actually doing an outreach to uh, remind folks about the most common violations we're finding and hopefully reduce them from being common. And then we can actually improve the confidence of our stakeholders if they have better understanding of what we're doing. So this project, of course, was part of the CDC cooperative agreement. Uh, and the goals here were to identify ways we could reduce duplicate effort and to share data. We needed to have a flexible standard uh, so that it, local jurisdictions could uh, bring their data together and work together to uh, be able to advance an understanding of what the findings are in the regulatory areas. Uh, increase our sharing uh, also to prevent illness and drive research and policy decisions.
Now, the object here is to improve our response. We want to have uh, less situations where we have uh, numerous people across jurisdictions getting sick uh, or within a jurisdiction. And to establish common data structure for food service and retail sales risk-based inspections uh, requires things like supporting a data sharing between environmental health jurisdictions and to be able to uh, have accessible evidence to support policy and practice standards. This also means that we can expand our research capacity in a scale and scope that uh, better addresses foodborne illness. And we can increase the ability to address foodborne illness before it happens, such as using something like the C4 methodology uh, to identify emerging outbreaks across jurisdictions. Now, a lot of folks get to benefit from this. Uh, for those who are on this webinar, I imagine most of you are in the regulatory realm, uh, the, the side of the clipboard that I live on, uh, and the ability to compare uh, regulations to find uh, best practices is rather difficult because the way one jurisdiction, uh, say Missouri, is collecting their data and reporting their data, isn't going to match up that here in Georgia or up in Massachusetts, where there's 315 or something like that different jurisdictions. And even within a state, like I said, within Massachusetts, they could have multiple systems. Uh, the cost of trying to pull that data together, the cost of uh, development of data systems, these are all very difficult to deal with. So jurisdictions can benefit from this by having a standard for which to either build a system for or to uh, be able to feed a system to. In other words, feed your data to a standard that can be grouped together and, and analyze, you know, used for analysis purposes. The increased data analysis capacity can drive policy and practice uh, with, with evidence. It also ensures that we have extraordinary transparency to allow for market forces and public perception forces to impact inspection outcomes. An evidence of this is such as if you have public posted uh, inspections, there's a uh, significant decrease in the violations. In other words, improved inspection outcomes. Primarily, or, or a couple of research papers have shown that this is just a positive result of the fact that the public can see this. The greater transparency by making our data more readily available should allow for us to have the public drive the market forces to help with better uh, compliance with food safety uh, practices. Went too far. The other part is that it can increase this confidence in the stakeholders. Our, our policymakers uh, get better confidence that we're actually doing our job not only right, but consistently. A huge part of what the private sector uh, complains about is inconsistency across jurisdictions because it means it's a heavier lift to try and maintain uh, the standards in these different locations because they have to modify their training, modify their equipment, all these different things, which is what is the driving purpose behind the FDA wanting us, everyone to try and adopt a common updated FDA food service food rule. So this is the same premise, is that by having consistency and the transparency we can provide, we get our stakeholders supporting us as well. Now the jurisdictions can uh, identify trends of problems in the regulated industry operations and prevent outbreaks. They can develop resources and workforce needs, you know, figure out what the workforce needs are by balancing the staffing. I mean, imagine if you could actually better understand uh, again, comparing apples to apples, where staffing is needed or where training is needed. We can improve the policies and programs with reliable and valid evidence instead of anecdotes and reactionary politics. Some of us don't like to talk about that side of things, but often uh, we become very active when within one area of environmental health or public health in general because of anecdotes or uh, things that jump into the public eye, though they are not the greatest risk that the community is being exposed to. Lower cost of developing an environmental health system obviously is an element of this because you spend less time in development and more time into 
making the system more useful, any kind of data system you uh, set up more useful and more user friendly because the back end structure is already kind of figured out. You also can get the economies of scale when multiple jurisdictions perhaps cooperate to build a system. Many, I believe it's 34 of the states are home rule states, the, vast, the majority of them are, which means that there's very few, there's fewer that have state centralized data systems for food service inspections. As such, the states cannot give a proper assessment of where resources are needed or where uh, outbreaks might be emerging uh, without having to go to clinical data after people are already sick. The rapid adoption of Allen analytics can be improved uh, because it's common structure. In other words, if you have the same building blocks to build your visualizations, your informatics from, you can move from one jurisdiction to the next and use similar data or the same data structure to say that apples to apples comparison is possible. And then the data governance. And what that means is being able to uh, ensure data quality and ensure accurate and reliable data collection, as well as the appropriate data sharing and appropriate data use uh, across an enterprise, across a jurisdiction or within a single jurisdiction. Additionally, the public can make incredibly well-informed decisions. Uh, if the public had available, if we made it available to the patrons, uh, each one of them can make an informed decision as to whether a particular restaurant or real estate food, is, food establishment, uh, whether they want to go and buy, you know, spend their money there. Adapting a common data structure can help the public better understand this. As I mentioned, various studies you can find in the Journal of Environmental Health uh, have noted that posting of, you know, public posting of inspection results ended up with better inspection outcomes. Here in Georgia, we put ours on the web. Uh, you can go to Yelp and pull that information down now uh, with generally good success nationwide. And the public is more looking to figure out where they're going to go eat before they get there than when they show up and they look at the menu. So the same thing could be applied here with the inspections as additional information they can use to make their decision. As I mentioned, Yelp already posts these scores. You can see an example of what it looks like on their screen. Uh, local jurisdictions can identify, perhaps if they can pull stuff together, uh, innovative practices and policies that have better outcomes and lower the resource demand on uh, the time, money, and staff uh, by being able to better balance the workloads. And as well as if they can reduce the incidence of risk factor violations, they end up with fewer follow-up inspections or repeat inspections or enforcement actions, which becomes a workforce multiplier. The transparent records also uh, helps us better understand the environmental health specialist behavior and the work performance. Some of this can be uh, perhaps that uh, you can improve the, the workforce performance through like gamification, which is an informal competition, you know, not even unspoken competition between staff and operators, uh, the folks we're regulating to say, hey, I'm doing more quality inspections here or hey, my inspections are coming out better there. There's also something called the Hawthorne effect, where people who know their activities are visible tend to behave more in compliance with expectations. So the combination of those things, at least here in Georgia, have had a big help for us for actually improving, uh, ensuring our standardization and improving our inspections. Decision makers can also uh, help out because by promoting transparency in our regulation, uh, with uniform data that can be shared with decision makers, legislators, commissioners, and so forth, and the funders to improve our uh, the state and local inspection programs, they can have confidence that our environmental health operations are, are, what we do is both reliable and valid because the evidence is in the data. 
you can't compare practices across jurisdictions, even if they're FDA standardized. You can't compare practices between two places because you can't validate uh, the data if they can't be joined together in some way to say apples to apples. The policy comparison side of things with standard data elements also allows for matching policies across the nation. If we're able to incorporate a, you know, some standard repository with using the common structure or a standard way of building a system, all these different operations could look at uh, things like the outcomes of illness and complaint incidents reports versus the FDA, FDA code versions. So that if you have different versions of the FDA code uh, or other local codes, you can do a comparison to see if their change in policy might actually benefit you in your jurisdiction. It also helps us identify where we may need training because instead of policy, it could be how we train our staff. Now, the data system costs is another area, like I said, if you have a lower time to develop a system and launch it, the contracts, the contract costs to an external contractor to build a system should be lower. It also allows for some standard item for when you're doing a request for proposal evaluation to see, can they accommodate a particular standard? A huge amount of expense goes in developing a data system for environmental health because we're rather unique and often considered the redheaded stepchild of public service and public health. Uh, by having a data, standard data structure and a sharing requirement within the uh, contracts that we have, it can reduce the cost of not only building a new system, but when it comes time to go from one system to a new one, that issue of having to do data conversion when you switch systems can be the cost of that conversion can be substantially lowered. Now, if you're considering a, a process change or a policy change, you could, if we utilize a standard, if we have something to stand on to say, okay, here's comparing apples to apples, we can compare communities with similar demographics and populations. When comparing overall performance, the comparison across jurisdictions with different policies and processes can lead to a normalizing to a core science-based assessment of violation items, regardless of the legal language or the data, stru or the data structure differences. If we have a standard for sharing, even if it's not built into your system, but a standard for being able to compile data across places, we can save massive amounts of time and expense uh, that goes into training staff and to using a data system, doing analysis, and it can reduce the costs, not just money, but time and effort uh, for whenever replacing a system. The transparency of uh, Data for food inspections also allows for policymakers to reliably consider public perspective and decisions. It can increase the priority of resources to fill needs uh, perceived by the public or to correct the efforts driven by anecdotal evidence. Uh, it's often, as I mentioned, uh, based on uh, political or, or just simply social uh, items of immediate importance though they're not overall the biggest risk to the public. When somebody says, my cousin's, you know, the commissioner's cousin got sick at this place and all of a sudden it's an emergency for us in the county to go in and do these inspections and react to that, uh, as opposed to, okay, yeah, he's one of 17 people across five different restaurants. We probably need to better assess what's going on here. That's the idea I'm talking about, is that if you have a data structure and an ability to do the analysis and track things, you can better address things by way of data as opposed to anecdotal evidence or simply reactive uh, public health practices. We also have the possibility of uh, assessing the outcomes of core decisions. You can compare, right now we really can't compare innovative practices without data across, you know, standardized across different policies. And when moving on this, we both we have to also recognize that public perception is a driver of the work we do. If they know that we're actively uh, 
comparing our data, we're actively uh, able to produce to them an understanding of where, why we're making decisions we're making for rules or for how we uh, act on a food inspection outcome, then we have the support of the public to be able to advance our, our practices. Now, regardless of what data you manage, and part of what came out of this mass feed project was recognizing that uh, there's some good practices one should follow uh, for managing a data system in general. Now, you may have paper records, you may have spreadsheets, you may have cloud-based data systems with AI. Uh, you really need to use best practices in any of those situations. You need to know that you own your data, no matter how you collect your own story or your records, make sure that you can access and control a bit of it at any time. Where possible, reduce the workload by automating what you need to do. And then, of course, you want to avoid ambiguity in your data. In other words, you don't want to say uh, beef when you're actually talking about, when you say meat, when you mean chicken or snake. Who knows? But you need to have some clear defined what do you mean when you record data. And you need to train your folks so that uh, they avoid using the other. You, if at all possible, please avoid choosing other because it's imp near impossible to try and figure out where it fits in the picture of any data set. And where also you can use open data. And when open, you know, when you have uh, open text, you want to try and reduce that as well. That increases the ambiguity. We'll go more to that in a moment. You want to be able to get some feedback. You learn what every user needs before building or changing a data system, because it will not be sustainable unless the users use it and use it the right way. That includes the management, the field staff, the office staff, staff clients, and the public. What is it that is going, they're going to be dealing with with your data? What is it that's going to be valuable to them? And of course, don't reinvent the wheel. There are standards like this one. There's standards across the nation for GIS. There's standards for a number of things. Use those standards. If you can find them and you know they're uh, practical for your purposes, use them. And don't, you know, share and learn from your peers. Go to other jurisdictions. Go to the NEHA AC, to the conference and talk with your peers there. Establish communication channels for being able to improve what you're doing. Now, the data ownership, I need to emphasize that if you don't own your data, uh, it's like, say you contract with somebody to have a data system in the cloud. If you don't have well-established data ownership when you set up those contracts, it's similar to saying, okay, I'm just going to put my file cabinets in a storage shed, and I don't own the key. I have to go ask for it. You need to make sure you have that key. You need to make sure you own the storage shed or in some way control it. It reduces a possibility of current data vendor of, of your current data vendor failing to support data conversion to a new system should you choose to do so. It also prior, it prioritizes uh, by prioritizing your ownership in an internal system uh, is one way to do it. Uh, it builds and drives a security standards and security and standardization as well as documentation of these factors. You have to be able to document that your system is uh, has some standards it goes by, as well as that it's properly secured. The top priority in a contract or an internal, if you decide to build this data system internally, even if it's just a set of Excel sheets, is that you need a decent project plan that includes everything from needs testing and numerous other, you know, as uh, needs assessment, uh, figuring out who your stakeholders are, figuring out who's going to be doing what parts in the project, what tasks are involved, who's going to do the testing to make sure it works, any data conversion, all these different things. Top priority is make sure you have a decent project plan. Having a project manager is key. The data structure is part of the ownership. In other words, when you say, I want our data at the end of this contract or the end of the project, we want it possibly for conversion, that structure is part of the data. It's the data about data that you need to know and how it is built 
and you need that information to transfer as well. So uh, if a vendor claims that the data structure is proprietary, I'd recommend against that because there are elements involved there that you have to know in order to convert to a new system. To that end, transitioning to a new system, data conversion, uh, you need to prepare for that because technology evolves. I'm not sure if you all remember, there were days when we had mainframes and that's how you connected to this data on uh, Unix systems. Uh, there were times when we had uh, racks, you know, just rack storages on uh, server spaces, server farms. We still use some of those. And now we have cloud storage. We have AI inserting into our work. Technology evolves. You need to build your system in preparation for that purpose of transitioning to new or upgrades, future proofing to some degree. It also facilitates the use of sharing with other partners. So when you set up a standard and you have ownership, especially if you, you have to have ownership to give authority to share your data with others, as well as to receive data and show that you're going to properly curate and properly maintain any data they share with you. With all that said, we have things evolving now with AI and automated features and so many other things. So if if you look at a paper map and you want to plan a road trip, how many of y'all are doing that now? Is anybody taking out or calling AAA and saying, hey, I need a road map you sent to me? They used to do that. Uh, and plan your whole trip. We don't do that anymore. Now we have automated processes. So you got to let the computers do the work. Things that used to take hours for you to build like a, a spreadsheet or a, a graph, now take milliseconds. You can send 500 and you know, 5,200 emails customized to each reception, each recipient on a regular schedule, just automated. You can calculate data fields such as risk type, zip code, pool volume, all these different things and uh, inspection due dates. That all could be automated instead of having to rely on the calculation by an individual, which not perfect there. Computers can be wrong too, but you can check and make sure they can rely on those calculations as part of building the system. There's also data validation. You can put rules into place in a data system like spelling checks, uh, time travel, in other words, where you start, <laughs> somehow you started the inspection after you finished it. A little backwards there. Not many of us have a TARDIS or a DeLorean, so we normally don't finish the inspection uh, before we start it, as well as uh, conflicting selections. So mobile food versus a hospital. Did they select the right thing for the situation that they're trying to check out? These data validation rules are automated, and they can help make sure your data is good quality and far more reliable. You want to incorporate feedback, of course. The most helpful people in making sure a data system works well for everyone are your most vocal critic, critic and the user who is slowest to learn the system. Listen to them. They're your foil that ensure that you make sure ensure that you don't miss the mark. With that extra effort needed to identify what challenges are needed to make them your advocates, you can have one of the better systems out there. So you want to include your stakeholders in defining the system capabilities. Include the users of all types in building, you know, in planning to build the system. And after launch, have an open and often reviewed system, you know, you know open conversations to review the system and receive and re uh, respond to user and public issues uh, as to how to improve that thing. And of course, avoiding ambiguity is always the best plan. The ease of being able to use a system uh, and user adoption levels has to be balanced against the reliability, validity, and the quality of the data that is required. Users will find ways to enter in what they think is important, and often just that, because they have so many other things going on, they don't enter in things that they're not forced to, to some degree, or they don't see as, hey, it's valuable to me later. They'll also misuse records 
and fields, if not trained and reminded on how and where the data is supposed to go. So they might be recording the temperatures down in the notes section of an inspection instead of recording them in the temperature records for the inspection. It's important to make sure that the training is in place and that it's really clear that where they record their information and that it's accurate. By providing some of the automated things for calculator fields and other things like that, you can help reduce ambiguity. And again, whenever possible, avoid other as a selection where there's open text and avoid open text typing wherever possible. You'll end up with a better system. You'll end up with better data. Need to make an adjustment. Make sure that something's going to work on this end here. Hopefully the audio will come through this time. This is a square. Can you guess what? Can you confirm audio is coming through? Confirm. Spot that goes the in. square. That's right. It goes in the square hole. Yes. Okay. And how about this rectangle? That one. Also the square. That goes in there too. Yeah. Up next, we've got this thin rectangle. The thin rectangle. Can you guess where that goes? The thin rectangle. That's right. It goes in the square hole. And up next, a cylinder. Hmm. The circle. I think that goes in the circle. The square hole. Now, we've also got the semicircle right here. Do you see a slot that would fit the, the semicircle? Semicircle? The, sem the semicircle. That's right, it's the square hole. Okay, up next, the triangle. We know what hole that goes the into, triangle. right? Triangle. That's right, the square hole. And up, la up next, we have the arch. The arch. The arch. You guessed it. The arch. It goes in the square oh, hole. God. That's just a quick demo because that's just a quick demo of, you know, when you're building the system and you're trying to train staff who weren't involved in helping build it, or you don't consider the potential alternate uses for fields or for record types, uh, you could end up with stuff you're not expecting. I, uh, that goes toward the issue of, you know, don't reinvent the wheel as well. Uh, if there's a well-established standard, well-documented, use it. There's ATSM standards for testing and labs. There's ISO things for process standards. There's uh, the environmental data management best practices from uh, the Interstate Technology Regulatory Commission, I, ITRC, I'm sorry. I, I, these are folks that have established standards, even uh, data quality assessment and review for USGS for soils. These are various standards that uh, are, are available for you to be able to utilize and make uh, good use of in how you build your system so that should you end up with data sharing uh, agreements, everyone involved can understand what field A means so that field A can be understood when it gets to the other side and they're saying, no, that's actually field B, but we understand what you mean. So it's important to try and have standards wherever possible. Now that gets into, I've kind of covered how we've uh, addressed, you know, why we're pursued this project, why we are trying to get something set up. This is the start of the first Q&A. I'll go ahead and say, Chris, if you want to open that up and see if we have anything there. Uh, yes, thank you, Tim. Uh, I do want to give people the opportunity. We do have the Q&A box. Uh, if anyone has any questions off of the first half of the content that has been covered, please use the Q&A box. Uh, we did in the registration um, ask if there were any questions uh, ahead of time, just the ability to kind of review content. Uh, and we do have a few questions uh, from there that at least we'll kind of ask. Uh, and then 
if the audience has anything else, uh, we'll take those questions. And if not, we'll move on to the next stage. Uh, so Tim, let me ask um, a question. Uh, one person uh, who registered uh, asked, is this MassB document ready to share with software developers? Well, this is publicly posted on the Nihau website. Uh, which means that if somebody wants to uh, consume it for their purposes of building in their own local system internally, or if a software developer says, hey, let's go ahead and build a new system, uh, there's, to my knowledge, Chris, you can correct me, I don't think there's any uh, uh, prevention of somebody adopting this as their way of building something. Would that be correct? That is correct. This is something that is uh, on the web page and there are no limitations to how it can be used. Uh, it's there to be a resource. And hopefully the, the main goal is to uh, make sure we're actually comparing the same type of data. So uh, the more jurisdictions that uh, take it and want to implement within their own jurisdictions, I, I definitely think it will be a, a positive resource when it comes to standardizing uh, data from a food safety standpoint. Appreciate that. All right, uh, and I have another one. Bear with me, Tim. This has is in multiple layers, so this may be uh, something that may also be tabled for the next Q and A piece as we kind of go into detail of the content. But I know somebody I uh, asked the question on. Uh, page four and five of the mass feed document uh, mentions data, how mass feed data should help jurisdictions and public and, and the decision makers. However, it is not clear what the role is of the industry. Um, wouldn't such data help support industry decisions in reducing risk factors? I, I can absolutely agree. I mean, we don't work as two completely separate entities, industry and the regulatory, you know, the, pu the, the public sector group that are doing the regulatory work, they have their own internal for business purposes, uh, both for liability as well as quality improvement, performance improvement in their operations. Data systems that are uh, very robust and very thoroughly used, that if we were able to join what they have with what we have in some way, we could probably get an even better picture uh, what's going on in food industry, what could be better practices uh, that could be shared across industry and the public sector. So I would love to see that that relationship expand even further. And that is a, a great point, Tim, and maybe that's something as this document, this isn't, although we this has been shared, uh, this is something that can continue to evolve. So maybe that can be uh, another opportunity to make sure that uh, all sides of uh, food industry and food safety are, are together when it comes to uh, having data that's shareable uh, and something that's useful to make sure that we, uh, the goal of reducing risk factors and people getting sick is uh, at the forefront. So definitely uh, well taken. Um, any questions? I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A box. So if there are no questions, uh, we can maybe go into the next stage where we're going into uh, a little more detail of the content within the descriptive document. Okay. This is more the meat of it. And unfortunately, we're down to 15 minutes on this. So I'm gonna, if I go through this, I do ask that you have questions, please put it in the Q&A box. I'm gonna go through a general description of the model. Uh, Tim, it is a model. Yes. Just to point out, uh, we do have this for an hour and a half. So. Oh, okay. Even better. I won't overdo it then. <laughs> so, so don't rush. Feel free to take. Your okay. Time. Thank you. Okay. I, I try to re be respectful of time wherever I can. Now this is uh, loosely based on the safety model, which was built for the aquatic code. Uh, this is a first version. This is a first draft. It will be numerous iterations, numerous improvements over time. R4C 
grand expansion and far better outcomes from this and what we were able to put together up to this point. So please keep that in mind as we look through this. Now, the thing about models, as uh, Professor Bach said, uh, all models are wrong, some are useful. Uh, the fact is, is that the minimum we're trying to have the minimum representation of at least the necessary data tables and fields, and it's not intended to limit, limit any addition of local, locally derived or locally determined essential fields or tables. In other words, this is a base. This is a beginning point. It's intended to be highly flexible and allow for you to customize it and expand it to your, to your needs. It has a normalized structure to maintain efficiency for large data sets. Uh, the idea behind normalization is that you don't have the same information in multiple tables multiple times. That's what normalization prevents and saves on space and makes a data system work much more efficiently. However, it is only a general model used for a, you know, a generally good data structure and practices for a relational database, not things like unstructured data, but for a relational database. It's not a soup, and it is in no way a substitute for a professionally developed database for specific jurisdictions without the additions to fit your processes and policies that you have to have in place. Thank you for dealing with the disclaimer, but the key here is this is a baseline that you can build upon. Now, the, it starts out with some core things like the information about the facility, including maybe a unique identifier, uh, what jurisdiction or regulatory jurisdictions is at play, the name of the facility, the legal business name, the address information. You can have you're going to need to know primary contact records, such as a phone number, email, mailing address, and information about the food venue, including things like the venue type. Is it a mobile food truck or is it a base of operation or is it a fast food place? You know, and risk categorization. The details of the inspection you're going to need in this, uh, including all the way down to, of course, the score or grade if you do that. Uh, any critical violations or all the violations that were recorded, the temperatures and various testing data and all those notes. The complete text of all violations should also be included. And of course, there's metadata, which is data about data, specific to the elements of the feed. For if you're sharing data via feed, you're going to need to have some background information to explain where it's coming from and kind of defining its limitations. And those would be agency specific. Such things as, you know, is there custom coding of data values uh, or are the fields and tables unique to supplying just for that jurisdiction or organization? Generally, it comes down to where, you know, you're going to want to know information about the facility and jurisdiction, the who, your primary contacts, the what information about the venue and the when, how and why, which are the details of inspections and complaints and such things. And then, of course, your metadata specific to the things that to that organization that's trying to share data. Now, a relational database is uh, just a quick primer on this. You have to organize your data to help it be more efficient to work in a database and do analysis out of the database uh, rapidly, as well as not use up too much storage space. Each record is, actually represents a single entity or single row in a table. And each table has a unique uh, structure to itself with each of these fields. Uh, and so you have a set of uh, records which are the rows and the fields are the columns. So if you look at a spreadsheet, the columns are the, rec are, are the fields and the rows are the, are the records. The data is structured and it follows a predefined schema that dictates data types, the relationships between tables, and what constraints are in place. It ensures data consistency and data integrity, and that's a key element of relational databases. Now, they establish links between the different tables uh, through shared columns. Uh, or foreign and parent keys and other ways of terming it, but a way to say this record 
is associated with that record enables an efficient data retrieval and analysis across a wide vast uh, array of data tables and volumes of data. Now there's data manipulation language that may be in place which provides commands for you know where to insert stuff, where to update stuff, whether it's deleted or not, um, and how to retrieve data from the database. There's data definition language that may be involved with the creation of modification, deletion of tables and, and records. And then learning things, and I highly recommend this, learning a general understanding of how SQL, structured query language, works. I'm not saying learn SQL to program. I'm saying understand the log logic behind how it works so that you can know how to do uh, complex data searches and aggregations when you go to do your data analysis. A nice part about databases is that they can scale. They can be for a single city of 3,000 people, or it can be for an entire nation of 330 million people. Scalability is a key element of relational databases. Additionally, you'll get some data security. It offers you know, access control. You can actually determine what fields in each record that different users can see or what records individuals can access. You get some data integrity because you have accuracy consistency throughout the database via constraints and triggers and data validation rules. And then you get transaction management. This enables the handling of multiple data operations as a single unit, guaranteeing consistency in the case of errors or failures. Now, this is a quick overview. This, this entity relationship diagram, or ERD, is a basic table relationship to show how things connect together. You'll notice that all the relationships are one to many. In other words, one record in one table can connect to many records in another table. So that one record is a parent, and the many records are the children or the child records of that parent. It's important to understand that concept. So you might have a parent key table, such as a jurisdiction or a district, you know, in this case, I'm calling it district ID. That's just an identification record. It's a, a common code, a unique identifier saying this is this jurisdiction. Uh, from there, you can have a child table. In this case, it's a facility table, and you'll see district ID as a field in that table, but it's not unique in that table. There's multiple district ID, you know, multiple times you'll see the same district ID because that is a child record. It is able to refer back so the one jurisdiction can refer to many facilities. That's the premise behind a relational database. And then from there we can go for a facility, we'll have a permit ID, and that can go on to the different food service inspections, as an example. Relationships defined uh, to uh, are necessary to define a framework a structure between tables. This re reduces duplicate data storage and speeds up the queries and data analysis. I recommend uh, having required fields uh, for data ba uh, for uh, base data needed to ensure that key information is collected. So you're definitely going to want to know the facility address. That should be required data, and it should fit a specific structure of like the USPS address or lat long structure. Uh, and then you can add additional fields for the organizational needs. We built this so that it would be flexible so that if your jurisdiction says uh, they want to know, uh, include in the permitting information, does this facility have a variance to the rules or uh, do we generally allow for a, a waiver or, or are they using uh, HACCP in their standard practices as part of the permitting process, you can incorporate that additional field element, yes, no, or selection list or something like that, additional fields to that facility record uh, as you build your system. And that can be part of what you share, but this is a base element of the minimum necessary to say, okay, we're trying to collect inspection information. 
The starting part of any family or the parent of the data is a primary location. So that's things like what jurisdiction is the data going to be generated? What location is the regulation operation going to occur? In other words, what's the address of this food operation? And then you have key primary records associated with all other records uh, throughout the database. So like what are the borders of the local offices uh, uh, jurisdiction or the offices addresses? What are the offices, uh, what are the uh, laws and rules that apply? That becomes important here because it's part of what populates your inspection data. So when you're citing a, recording a citation or citing a rule when you're recording a violation, you're going to want to be able to know which set of rules. Is it my jurisdiction or is it another jurisdiction's rules that you're uh, referring to? What are the local policies and practices for scoring? Uh, those are some of the things that you have to define as part of the jurisdiction. Uh, and then you also have some certain data validation rules that you'll apply in your system when you go to build it. And that'll be specific to your use and your jurisdiction. By using national standards for items like location, uh, you're able to fulfill the needs for when you have to, when you're wanting to increase your data sharing capacity. The who really can't be understated. Uh, you can't provide services without having a customer or client. Privacy of some of these things may be restricted. Keep that in mind. There are states that don't allow for governments to share phone numbers and email addresses or jurisdictions that don't. Uh, it, is an, it is the who is an indicator of the primary or other type of contact associated with a facility. So it, it, you may have numerous contacts. You'd have the owner, you might have the billing address, you may have the operator on site, you may have uh, an English speaking or other translator type contact available, emergency contacts if there's a fire or whatever other contacts, you could have any number of contacts. And that's the nice part about relational databases is that you can have all kinds of different records associated with that one facility and become very helpful for different purposes. Other information may include things like certification. Is this a CFSM? Are you tracking or issuing the CFSM type of thing for yourself? Is there an insurance element that's required? Uh, and then there's other things that could be relevant just to your jurisdiction, and they can be related records that are contacts for these things. Again, try and use standards. Standard, you know, if you're going to record demographics, use the US Census standards for those demographic elements. If you're going to collect a phone number or an email address, have the system restricted to a format that fits the uh, type of data it is. An email field can be restricted to where it always has the at symbol and something and then a dot and then something else. You can actually put these formatting restrictions in place to ensure you get valid email addresses. Now the facility, the what, is the information needed to be able to record a permit or issue a permit or a license or certification or a similar approval for by the jurisdiction is generally saying yes this is info about you that tells me yes we can issue a, allow you to operate under these rules it's a key record from which various activities and service records stem so it's a parent record for the inspections and complaints and other things it is not the address information keep that in mind this is just more relative to the operation and the descriptive elements like number of seats, menu type, business model, stuff like that. The address is yet another contract record. So make sure I'm not missing something here. So using established standards where possible is definitely, I'm trying to make it a common theme throughout the mass feed. And within the dictionary, you'll see where I actually refer to certain standards. Now, the when, how, and why. This is where the meat really, this is where the, the meat of all of this comes in. What work is related to food operation? 
The rest of MassFeed consists of the information related to inspections and complaints and other services. The structure is a clear connection between the records and maintains a full history of the food operation. The idea behind this is so that you can look at performance over time as well as performance across different facilities. And then finally, data about the data. When was it last revised? When was the system updated? What updates happened over time? Is it the first or last record uh, that you're looking at? Uh, database type and platform, who owns the data? Uh, quality limitations, in other words, where you know that uh, certain jurisdictions were uh, standardized inspectors and others were not. Are there unique fields and you need to describe them? These are all data about data. You need to make sure that they're, that's part of what gets documented when you're uh, collecting or sharing your system and your data. There are, you also have to note the restrictions for use, whether or not your jurisdiction says, we do not share uh, phone numbers and emails. You may have to address that when developing data sharing agreement and stuff like that. And again, using standards. Uh, the FDA's Office of Regulatory, oh shoot, I forget the A, but Data Exchange. The DX stands for Data Exchange. There's elements of that that don't fit into the food service or retail sales, but they can help us uh, do a little bit of apples to apples comparison as to how manufactured foods and other operations that FDA regulates uh, correspond to how we do our work in the field for retail sales and, and food service. GIS standards are well established and then various law and implementation dates. We get into the detail tables and as always the devil's in the details and this is where I spent most of my time. They support the data quality and collection for providing items to select in the user interface. These are supporting actors that form the details uh, required in the inspections. So the inspection layout, what, what, how many questions are there? What are the questions that are asked or what are the items on the inspection? Where do they fall in sequence on the inspection? What elements are required or not in the inspection? Uh, code references, your jurisdiction will have a collection of uh, its own table of food, uh, food codes that you want to be able to reference and cite in the inspection and do, draw that connection there. The various item findings. The, uh, you know, the different violations you record, those go into their own table by themselves. Are you collecting samples? What are the relevant factors and standards that are associated with those sample types? And of course, collecting temperatures. Who's getting assigned to do what inspections? That's another table that you could be using. Uh, plan review. I didn't build much in the plan review phase because it is very different for each operation and across all the jurisdictions as to how people do plan review. So we left that as flexible as possible to build out locally to fit your needs. Then you have the intermediary tables. When, when you can't really put a, draw, uh, a line between uh, parent and uh, associated record because it may be linked to two things. So like you may have a uh, Burger King, uh, two, three, five Burger Kings owned by the same person. By using these intermediary tables, these are things that allow us to say, okay, this owner is associated with five Burger Kings and that way it can be the table is connected to an intermediary somewhere in between and then to that contact information. Or in the case of mobile food, you may have a uh, mobile food operation or mobile food unit that works in three, four or five different locations. You can actually establish uh, one location record and you can have multiple food, mobile food units that go to that same location and multiple locations for mobile food units. And a many to many type thing is facilitated by way of these intermediary tables. Now bringing it all together, again, this is a first attempt, first draft. This model was assembled based on one state's version of the food code and, and the standard that existed 
in uh, 2023. This is intentionally incomplete as a base item needed for food service and retail sales inspections. As a jurisdiction adopts the mass feed, either for sharing or for building their own system, each violation and rule citation record needs to be tied as part of the process to ensure a standard and ability to share to the closest matching FDA code. In other words, when you record, when you record this particular citation, you know, rule, whatever, it should have as part of preparing your data set and preparing your violation or your code uh, references, have a matching or as close as possible FDA code match. And that's built into the system to have that matching field, say it's associated with something very similar in FDA code here. It allows for comparing inspection findings and outcomes across jurisdictions because of that FDA code correlation, because we all operate a little differently. It also ensures some validity to identify you know, innovative practices, at least that's the hope, like scoring schemas or even outreach and education efforts. NEHA is making the mass feed openly available to allow any agency or company to use it to either build your system or to share your data as a way to package it and share it with other jurisdictions and work off of a common same page type of uh, agreement. I hope I didn't rush too much, but I throw this out to Q&A. And I'm going to go ahead and glance in chat first, and then look at Q&A. All right, uh, Tim, uh, thank you for going into detail. Uh, there is a few questions. Uh, the first question, how does one transform the spreadsheets into forms for inputting data in field? OK. So if you're going from either a paper record or a spreadsheet system of recording these things, you're halfway there. I, because what you have is the data elements you want to record and now you're in the you move into the process of okay how do I make this fit into this data model. So if you look through the mass feed model you'll see I those fields I tried to use common language for identifying okay this belongs here, and then I also define a little bit as to what you know what that field is intended for. So you may have in your spreadsheet, the permanent number and the name of the facility. And then the address of the facility. That permanent number and name of the facility will go on the facility record. The address of the facility will go into the contact record. And that's a way to say, oh, excuse me, that would also be part of the facility. But these, these would all be broken out in a way uh, each of the different columns of the spreadsheet would be the fields, and each of the rows would be different records. But you may have to break the uh, one table up into multiple smaller tables to be able to accommodate recording the inspections and other things in the mass feed. So for example, you'll have a, uh, your facility, the permit number and name, and then you may have multiple inspections in there for that facility. Those multiple inspections would then go into an inspection record and the you know, related scores and so forth from there. And that's how you break it down. See, the second question here is, can mass feed be extended to be used in all EH related inspections and investigations of different facilities, not just food? Somewhat. This was built more for the approach. Uh, I see Chris wants to answer it. <laughs> uh, this was built somewhat for the approach of uh, risk-based inspections of operations as opposed to construction or uh, initial approval type of things. Um, it's operational assessment. So the pools safety standard, which I started with and started from there and built out, you'll find very common things like location and venue for the permit information, 
you'll find commonality there. So yes, it, uh, it could be extended for things like body art, uh, tourist accommodations, emergency shelters, things like that. Um, possibly even to hazardous waste sites if it's operational as opposed to complaint driven. Those are all elements that could be applicable. It would not fit well uh, to things like on-site sewage inspections. The maintenance and operation, maybe, but the general initial install or repair inspections, not as much because we'd have to have different, uh, different ways of recording the important elements that are part of that type of, uh, type of inspection. Hopefully that answered the questions. Are there more? For those fields that don't have a current common standard, is there an initiative or work group underway towards a common standard? There are numerous ones. Um, ASTO, uh, Association of State and Territory Health Officers, uh, is looking at a messaging standard of something. Uh, we have, uh, like I said, the uh, ITRC is one that goes for sampling, environmental sampling as a data standard. Um, this is the, uh, not the first time that food service inspections have been approved or pursued as a way to do a standard, uh, like AFTO has their safer data system build that uh, some jurisdictions have adopted. So, Carrie, if you if you have, if I'm not answering your question, hopefully I you know, I don't know if you want to put put more details there. I'm happy to respond to that, but hopefully I'm answering the question. All right, um, and Tim, there, I do have one question. Uh, if you can maybe going down that rabbit hole and now there's uniform data that's now shareable, what could jurisdictions do with shared data set across city, county, state lines? I'm gonna stop sharing and talk then. I... The data sharing challenge at this stage often uh, hits a first roadblock in public health organizations with concern over privacy data. And environmental health is unique in public health in that huge portions, huge swaths of our data is public record. Our inspections, our permits um, are, are each generally deemed public record, which means our data sharing capacity uh, is far greater than most every other part of public health. So getting your agency and your policymakers to understand that first and building a partnership with adjacent organizations, adjacent uh, jurisdictions, uh, to start that conversation as to how you can do it and do some brainstorming on uh, uh, case, uh, you know, business cases or operational cases where there's a value to you. I mentioned in the beginning here, there was a, uh, some possibility of being able to uh, identify maybe a frequency of certain violations or certain food types that are across different jurisdictions and operations. Uh, it may have been that the peanut allergy or peanut outbreak that happened that killed a few people some time back may have been able to have been caught earlier had we identified uh, where places were serving uh, peanut and they called in, people called in sick as a complaint, you know, and caught that earlier as opposed to waiting for lab confirmation uh, using the C4 type of methodology. Uh, these are all, that's just one possibility. There's also the ability to have uh, an agreement saying, okay, we see that in this jurisdiction, they've implemented this education outreach and they have a need for fewer staff because they have fewer people, uh, fewer repeat inspections and there's resource savings there. Perfect, thank you for that, Tim. Um, 
Any other questions? Uh, if you have them, please add it to the Q&A box. I know we have covered quite a bit of information. Uh, so as we get to uh, the end, we do want to thank you all for attending. Uh, join in this webinar to learn more about Mass Feed uh, and this capabilities. Uh, this webinar is recorded and will be added to the web page as a toolkit. So this is something that can be shared uh, with anyone uh, as far as someone that manages data as well as decision makers. Uh, you will receive an evaluation that we hope you can complete. Uh, in that evaluation, there is opportunity to ask additional questions as we want to make sure uh, uh, that you have the time to be able to digest the content. Uh, and we want to make sure that we kind of meet the need when it comes to any additional responses that may kind of come from it. Uh, and depending on the number of questions we receive, uh, we will potentially either put a document together with uh, those questions as an additional resource, or uh, if you have that desire, we might have another webinar that we can go into more detail and talk to Tim uh, about some of the, the content and the capabilities and components within the mass feed document. Uh, thank you, Tim, for presenting and going into detail uh, about this tool. Uh, we greatly appreciate you all taking time out your schedules to be with us, and we hope that you uh, enjoy the rest of your day, but please make sure that you respond to the evaluation. It will be greatly beneficial to us. Uh, so thank you and have a nice day.